We're going to continue our study in the book of Romans today. Romans chapter 5, for those who are normally with us. Oh, just look at verses 15 and 16 today, Lord willing. I intended to go all the way through verse 17, but I don't think the Lord is going to allow that. So. But if you recall from our previous lessons, we saw how that death reigned even before the law of Moses. That if, because of what we call original sin, because man has the law of God written in their hearts, but we know that man's view of the law of God has been corrupted by depravity. Amen. And we also saw how the Adam was a, a type of Christ and that they were both representative heads. But here in the next several verses, we'll see the contrast between the two. When, just for example, we see in Adam that we fall to sin, but in Adam we all die, and in Christ we live. Verse 15 and 16, we'll look at today, it says, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God, and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one the condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Amen. Well, I'll admit the wording here might be a little confusing to our, our 2023 English today, but I hope I can make sense of it for you all. It says, beginning here, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. That the free gift, as he calls it here, is not like the offense. The offense meaning Adam's transgression and our fall in him. And the free gift being eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Romans 6.23 tells us that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And he says these two are not, they're not alike. Yes, Adam and Christ are both representative heads for groups of people. But yet, what we receive in and through them are in contrast one to another. Mm -hmm. That in Adam we receive the sin nature and all that comes with that, and in Christ we receive a new nature and all that comes with that. Right. He says, but not as the offense, so also the free gift, for if through the offense of one many be dead, that is through Adam's transgression, many have died, have they not? That's I, right. And we all receive death because of Adam. We've all received that sin nature. And as verse 12 told us, for that death has passed upon all men. <laughs> How many people have died because of Adam's transgression? I wouldn't attempt to add it all up. I'd say it's billions, if not trillions. Right. Just this year alone, about 64 million people will die. Yeah. Well, for those who are interested in statistics and math, it's about well, 8 out of 1,000 people will die every year. Mm. That, of course, spikes when there's global disease and global war. Yeah. But yet, every year, millions of people are going to die. And ultimately, that cause is because of sin. Right. Yes, we know there's cancer. We know there's heart disease. We know there's accidents. We know there's all these things. But sin is the root cause of why there is death in this world. Amen. And it all goes back to the transgression in the garden. Because of this one offense, as it's called here, because death has reigned for thousands upon thousands of years. And until the Lord returns, death will continue to reign. Amen. But the scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that the last enemy that shall be defeated is death. Mm -hmm. One day Christ will defeat death, but and we're not getting off on a rabbit trail here, but every single person that's been born since Adam will die unless we know unless the Lord returns in a lifetime. Only two exceptions we've ever seen to that are Enoch and Elijah. And some theorize that they are the two witnesses of Revelation that will come and die in the street for three days. But besides physical death, every person experiences spiritual death. And that is a much greater concern than physical death. That every man is born in this world spiritually dead, 
without life unless God is pleased to extend his grace and the Holy Spirit makes us be born again. So through this death, or through this offense, death has come, sin has come, condemnation, judgment, wrath were all brought on to us because of one man's sin in the garden. And they've had. But he said, next, much more the grace of God. You know, trans if Adam's transgression brought us all this, how much more shall the grace of God bring? And Paul is using these two to compare. Yes, sin is great, but God and his grace is much greater. Mm -hmm. the, the transgression of Adam, his sin in the garden, it caused death, it caused the curse to come, it caused all this suffering and pain that we experience today. We get how much greater is the grace of God? Instead of death, we receive life, don't we? Instead of sin, we receive righteousness. Instead of condemnation, we receive justification. Amen. Well, those are just a few of the things that we receive from the hand of God through His grace. But yet, all those things are greater than what we received in Adam. What we receive in Christ is so much greater than what we received through Adam, isn't it? I said, in, you know, in Adam we received all these awful things, such as sin and death and condemnation. We get in Christ we receive eternal life. We receive His righteousness. We receive, like I said, His justification. His ultimately we will share in glory with Him for all eternity. Amen. So, yes, the offense was great, but God's grace is much greater. That's what he's saying here when he says, for if through the offense of one be dead, much more the grace of God. And then he says, and the gift by grace. And this is that gift that we spoke of, the free gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it is by this gift that we receive all these blessings that we mentioned, life, righteousness, justification, and so on. And we receive this gift by grace. You can be sure that it's not by anything you can earn or anything you can work to or anything you can buy. It does not come by being baptized or by going to church or joining a certain church. Amen. So nor can it be given by your parents or your grandparents or the preacher or the pope. You can be sure it's 100% of the goodness and unmerited favor of God. That it is by grace means it is something we did not deserve. It is given to us simply because God in his goodness wanted to give it to us. This gift comes by grace and yet there are so many that think they can earn it, they can work their way towards it. And yet if it were by works, there could be no more grace, Paul tells us. Amen. And he says it was it is by grace, and he also says that it is which is by one man, Jesus Christ. Again, you can be 100 percent sure that eternal life only comes through Christ. Amen. That salvation cannot be found in the church, it cannot be found in the Pope, it cannot be found in Mary, it cannot be found in Muhammad or Buddha or any of these others. It was much as I'm sure Brother Larry would love to be able to give salvation to his lost loved ones. Salvation can only come through the person of Christ. Amen. You can be sure that man may seek it all these other ways, but he will not find it except for in Christ. I've read of some Islams, some of the people that follow Islam, some Islamic people, and they say that well, they study the life of Muhammad, and then they study the life of Christ, and they they saw that Christ is the only way. Amen. No salvation comes only through one man. In fact, John fourteen six tells us that He is the only way to the Father. No man comes unto the Father but by Me. He says. And then 1 Timothy 2, 5 tells us that Christ is the only mediator between God and men. Mary is not going to 
come to your rescue. Right. Unlike what the Catholic Church teaches. Really, none of the other saints in heaven are going to hear your prayers and intercede on your behalf either. Christ is set down on the right hand of God, and He is the only one that can make intercession for us. Mm -hmm. So that there's many that put their trust in the fact that they're a member of a good, sound church, or because they give to the church, or because they do this or do that. But salvation can only be found in the man we call Jesus Christ. Amen. And just as a side note, we won't spend too much time at this point, but you can be sure that Jesus was both man and God, 100%. Right. He was not just a good man, but he was God the Son and the Son of God. And he was not just a prophet or someone who had good advice and good teachings, but that he was the very Son of God and God the Son in the flesh. In him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Paul writes. So that's a whole other lesson we could spend on the God man, the Lord Jesus Christ. But be mad. You can be sure he was a man tempted in all points like as we were, yet without sin. And because of that, he can be the perfect Savior for us. Yeah. Well, it says here next in our text. This gift comes by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. This is so referring back to the grace of God, the gift by grace. Adam's transgression has caused the death of many, but so has, in contrast, the gift of or excuse me, the grace of God has abounded unto many, he says. Mm -hmm. It's been abundant unto many, that it's overflowed, if you will, where our sin abounds, God's grace bounds even greater. Amen. You know, I don't profess to know how many people have been saved throughout history, but I do know that the grace of God through the gospel has appeared throughout the whole world. Mm -hmm. And it has, as Paul words here, abounded unto many. But his grace has been given to many. Let's say it might be millions, it might be millions, I don't know. I guess we'll no, when we all get to heaven, as the song says. Amen. I know it's not, it's few by comparison to probably the many that are, will be in hell, but I know for sure that there are still many that experience the grace of God. Mm -hmm. There might be some that surprise us that are there, but there might be some that surprise us that aren't there. Right. But you can be sure the grace of God has went out through all nations and I think and that was the prophecy that it would the gospel would be preached in all the world to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every tribe of people. And that if that's nothing else that's being fulfilled in our day when we through missionaries and through preaching the gospel that's available on the internet and other such means. <laughs> The grace of God has abounded unto many. I think sometimes we think that, well, there's just a couple of us left. What are we going to do? You right. like Elijah, don't you? Up there. You know, I'm the only one left. They seek to take my life. What does God say to him? I have 7,000 men that have bowed the knee in the veil. Amen. Amen. Well, certainly. We may be few in number compared to the world. God still has many people serving him today. You're right. His grace has reached many throughout history. For I'd say until he returns, it will reach many more. Well, let's not be discouraged when there's only a handful of us here today. You can be sure God has plenty of people serving him throughout the world. Amen. Dover, there's a town of about 1,300 people. There's 8 billion people in this world. Mm. So, you know, we might be small in number here, but we can be sure that God has people all the way over in even countries like China that are especially yeah. serving Him. Let's go on to verse 16 here. He says, And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. He uses that same 
same type of phrase here as it did in verse 15, but that here we have another contrast of how the gift is not like the offense, that how salvation is not like the sin that came to us through Adam. And he says, for the judgment was by one to condemnation. Judgment against sin is always condemnation until the grace of God be applied. Amen. As we'll see in verse 18, Lord willing, next week, that this condemnation has come upon all of us. It only took one transgression for Adam to be pronounced guilty and under condemnation before God. And you can be sure that it only takes one sin to pronounce you as guilty as well. Amen. So we all receive that sin nature from God. We all are born in sin and we all very quickly go about sinning in our own selves. So really there is none that are free of this condemnation. What did Christ say to Nicodemus that him that believe not is already condemned? Mm -hmm. Christ did not come in the world to condemn sin. Or to condemn us, he came in the world to condemn sin. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to come in the world to say, Oh, yeah, you're on your way to hell. He did do that sometimes, but we were already on our way there. Right. Well, we were, from the time that Adam sinned and until the Lord saved us, we were under that condemnation. And if you're not saved here, you're still under that condemnation today. Amen. Except the free gift be given to you and you will abide forever under that condemnation. Don't let the, the heretics fool you and think that you're going to go to purgatory and work your way out sometime. Right. Or that somehow your, your loved ones will be able to pay enough money to get you out of there. Or you'll either lift up your eyes in hell like the rich man or you'll be in the presence of your Lord and Savior forever. Amen. He says here, but for the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. The Adam only had that one sin that condemned him, and yet we have many offenses, don't we? This, that one sin plunged Adam and the whole human race into the curse, and yet we have many sins and trespasses before God. Yet God in his grace is much greater than our sins. Amen. Yet even though we have many offenses, God takes those offenses and he, as he said here, he gives us justification. He makes us just as if we had never sinned. Amen. And that person has said, you know, at the end of this chapter, in the end of chapter six, we'll see how that where how our sin did abound, but God's grace did much more abound. Mm -hmm. Well, here we've come nearly full circle back to verses 6 through 8. Are you wicked and ungodly? Are you a great sinner? God, grace is greater, isn't it? That God died for the, that Christ died for the ungodly, that he died for sinners. That is really the whole point of what we're driving home here, is that sin has been present with us ever since Adam. Amen. And yet Christ is the remedy for sin. That sin and all, and as a result, death and all the sufferings and pains of this world will come because of one man's transgressions. And then we all are seeing sin nature and sin our own selves. But mm -hmm. the solution, if you will, is found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the law could not save, the works cannot save. The church in and of itself could not save, the Pope or the preacher or anybody else could not save, but yet by this one man, Jesus Christ, can all these things be remedied. Amen. The blood of Christ covers a multitude of sins, and certainly we all have a multitude of sins, don't we? Mm -hmm. We might not like to think of ourselves that way. Naturally, the man, man likes to think of himself as a pretty good person. Not that bad, but when you really compare yourself to God's standard of righteousness, we were all ungodly and wicked and great sinners in this sight. Mm -hmm. 
And as Paul said in 1 Timothy 1 5, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all the acceptation that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. There you go. And really, if we were truly were to examine ourselves in comparison to the scriptures, we would say the same thing with Paul, that we are the chief of sinners. Mm -hmm. You know, by man's standards, I was a pretty good kid before the Lord saved me, but yet by God's standard, I was wicked and vile in need of a savior. That's it. And even the best of men, except they experience the grace of God, they are just as wicked and vile as anybody else. So we like to think of people like Hitler and Hussein, that they are very, somehow more sinners than the others, but yet Christ said, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. Amen. I didn't write that down in my notes, but he's, he gives several examples of people who were sinned and met very dramatic deaths, and yet Christ told the people that were listening there, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. Mm -hmm. I think he repeats that phrase at least three times there in the book of Luke. Except you repent, you shall likewise perish. And it is the same today. No matter how good you may see yourself, no matter how wicked you may be, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. Amen. And when you see yourself as that guilty and vile and wicked sinner, the only thing I can do is tell you to flee to Christ. He's the only one that can save you. Yeah. So Lord, well, we'll look more next week at how God's grace is greater than our sin. But as we start chapter 6, we'll see that that's not an excuse for us to sin now. So in close with that thought. Amen.